guys are welcome to come on up to the front. Trust in your name, Jesus. Able to save and deliver us. We put our hope in your name, Jesus. Blessing and honor, glory and power unto our God forever and ever. All of the honor, all of the praise is yours.
we just focus on you today. We focus our hearts and our minds on you. Come on, lift your hands.
Just raise your hands to him this morning. God, you are so good and so gracious, Lord, that your calling on our lives never fails. It never ends, never quits. You never give up on us. You never give up on us, Jesus. God, we know, Lord, that you would tear down any wall that we've built around ourselves. That you would search our hearts and heal any wound that tried to steal our breath and take our joy. That you would seek the areas of our soul that we've hidden and denied even of ourselves. And that you would take those things in our lives that we've protected, that we've stored away. And that you would be so good and so gracious that if we would allow you to, that you would take from us. And in exchange, your goodness. In exchange, hope. In exchange, a future. God, that you never, ever give up on us. As we sing this song, I want you to, I want you to think about his goodness in your life. And just so you know, your love story between you and God is not like mine or not like the person to the right or the left of you. Your love story between you and God is that he has gone through this journey of life with you every step of the way, even when you felt like he wasn't. And he calls you his own. And he says that he sees you and that he knows you like nobody knows you. That he has a plan and a purpose for you. 
that if you would just let him, he would give that to you this morning. Thank you, Lord. Just allow him to search your heart right now. You call the sun to rise and you lay it down to rest. You hold this heart of mine. And you
So some of you guys on the uh, the table, you know, when they when they take you into an ambulance and your heart has stopped. I see some of you guys just laying there, and and what are those called? The sh the shock the shockers that they use. That. I see you getting shocked with the love of Jesus, like a earthquake in your spirit that wakes you up that wakes you up, you forgot, you forgot, but now you remember, now you remember his love, now you remember his unrelenting, unconditional love that's not like any man or any woman, it's not like any love from a father or a mother, it is unbroken. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for giving us a heartbeat again. Thank you, God.
by your stripes. We're going to sing that part again, you guys. Think about the word. By your stripes, Jesus, we're healed. It's already been done. We have to receive it. Physical healing, emotional healing, all of it in an instant. Jesus, we love you. By your stripes. Cause by your stripes, I am healed. With one touch, I am made whole. You have spoken, and I know that it is so. Cause in the Father, we thank you for your spoken word. As we go about today, Lord, we just want to honor those. We want to celebrate those that have made the ultimate sacrifice this Memorial Day. We just pray for their families that even in their grieving, it doesn't matter how long it's been, that your Holy Spirit is still there to bring comfort to them, to bring peace to them, to encourage them and strengthen them that they made the ultimate sacrifice that we can live today in freedom because of what they did. We will not forget their sacrifice and we just thank God for the braveness. We thank God for them making a decision to lay down their life it wasn't by choice, but they knew when they went into the battle that it will happen. And because of they loved us and wanted our freedom, they made the sacrifice. So always remember them, to honor them, to keep them in remembrance, and to pray strength for their families. Amen? So, Father, we just thank you for this day. You, we just thank you for how you laid, you made the ultimate sacrifice as well, and that we will never forget you. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your blessings and all that you provide for us. Amen? So let's talk about our tithes and offering. You all may have a seat. Well, I want to talk about a couple things. The Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes chapter 11, it says, verse 1, cast your bread upon the waters, that after many days you will find it again. Then in Genesis 8, 22, it says, while the earth remaineth, seed, time, and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. Well, I want to share a little testimony. Well, most of you know that in, at Encounters, I had my own separate encounters, amen? <laughs> I ended up in a hospital. Well, a couple of things that happened. Once I remember before I ended up in the hospital that I was at church on Sunday and it was seed, time, and offering. So I had an opportunity to sow my financial seed I gave it time, and you will reap a harvest. Well, one thing that I've learned about the kingdom of God was different. In the natural, if you plant an apple seed, you're going to get apples. You plant oranges, you're going to get? Well, in the kingdom of God, it's different. The Bible says that when you cast your seed upon, when you cast your bread upon many waters, well, we know waters is not steady, right? You ever go to the ocean, you see if you drop something, you're not going to find it because it's not in the same spot. So in my little encounter that I had at the hospital, I have medical insurance. I have good medical insurance, okay? So I was not in need of a financial seed at that time, right? So I was there. The doctor started coming saying, oh, something's wrong with your heart. 
We don't know if you have a heart, if you're having a heart attack or what's going on. So then I began to get a little nervous. So I was like, okay, this is not sounding good. And then naturally, fear tried to slip in, and then doubt tried to slip in, and all the bad reports. So then I thought, wait a minute. The Bible says, cast thy seed upon the bread, and after many waters, it's going to come back. So the seed that I needed at that time was the seed of prayers, right? I needed encouragement. I needed strength. And I lay there, and I began to experience you all. I began to experience your prayers. I began to experience the seed that I had sown into everybody else's life. So at that time, instead of me listening to the report, I sat up. I thought about your prayers. I felt your prayers. I said, no, I shall live and I shall not die, and I will declare the works of the Lord. Amen. I got out of the hospital, and I was in Florida last week on the beach. Amen. <laughs> so I just wanted to encourage you, plant your seed. We give our financial seed, but we can give seeds of prayers. We can give seeds of joy and encouragement. And most of all, I felt you all seeds of love. So I want to thank you, but I want to encourage you today so your financial seed, because you never know how it's going to come back. Amen? So let's pray. God, I thank you for the seed that you continue to bless us with so that we can sow into the kingdom of God. We know that as we sow financial seeds, the needs of this ministry will be met, souls will be saved. But Father, we're also expecting you will meet our need with the seed that we sow. It doesn't matter the time because we're going to sow in faith. So we release our faith right now, ministering angels. We command you to go forth and bring back our harvest in a time of need. In Jesus' name we pray. Ushers, you may come forth. Thank you all again, and I'm so happy to be in this family. Amen. Hi, I'm Paul. And I'm Ashley. And this, this is, is CFT and Chandler. Chandler. Hey, CFT and Chandler. Looking to get connected? Well, go see a leader or download the app for the closest connect group nearest to you. Hey, guys. Are you looking for an opportunity to serve? We have so many opportunities here at CFT and Chandler. So head to the connect table and find what works for you. Hey CFT and Chandler, SOP starts tonight. The only pre-requirement is that you have to have gone to Encounter. So if you guys haven't already registered, do so on the app. You do not want to miss this opportunity. Hey CFT and Chandler, great news. Our first Kids Encounter will be held June 4th and 5th. So please get registered ahead of time to reserve your spot. Hey guys, here's some future events coming up. Women's Encounter, August 20th through the 22nd. Men's Encounter, August 27th through 30th. Kingdom Cultured Women Conference, July 10th from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. So mark your calendars and save the date. That's it for the announcements this week. Enjoy the service, CFTN Chandler. CFTN Chandler, glad you could be here with us this morning. We have a um, kind of an announcement that we want to share. We'll ask uh, Kyle and Stella and their family to come on stage, and Jen and her family. Alex is, is not here today, but come up on stage, and my lovely wife. <laughs> Dramatic pause. Well, we are planning a church in San Antonio, Texas. These are the people that will be staying. All of you will be moving to San Antonio. I'm kidding. Um, Kyle and Stella will be 
leading this work. They're going to go there. They're, they're transitioning within in the next few months. Alex and Jen are already have a house there. So they're, they're in the midst of transition. They're going to be starting uh, connect groups and houses. They're going to be moving from there, and we're going to see it just bloom into a church. So we're super excited. So we wanted to take this time and share it with you guys. Because this is a seed, and this is your fruit. You know what I mean? This is what God's really put on our heart, is to see the kingdom expand and kingdom culture expand, that the world would be what Jesus had intended to, a place where people actually love people and are for people. Amen? Amen. So what we're going to do now, we're going to stretch out our hands towards them. And we're going to just pray. Lord, we just thank you so much for what you've placed in the hearts of these people. We thank you, Lord, on behalf of CFT and Chandler and everybody that's been praying, Lord. We pray, Lord, for just overwhelming blessing, for favor, for, for uh, provision, and for prosperity, Lord. That their businesses would thrive, their, their families would thrive there, Lord. And we speak where they set their feet, they shall have. We speak that when they step ground there, Lord, there will be spiritual territory. That people will be set free from addictions, that families will be restored, that children will be restored to their parents, Lord, and you'll do a work that everyone would know, Lord, that it was you who did it. We thank you so much, and it's in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen, amen. amen. <laughs> There'll be more to share. We'll have a going away. Go, my, or my wife would say, we usually do going away parties, but sometimes my wife says she has go away parties. <laughs> They're a little different. S great things are just happening in our midst. Is, is it okay if I share a little bit about Richie? Okay, this is, this is Richie's mother here, and, and Richie has some, uh, some health and physical disabilities and difficulties, and when he was able to walk, he walked very um, bow-legged or there's a huge gap. Well, Ricky um, was no longer able to walk, so it wasn't looking good. And last week, uh, my wife and his mom and a group of people got together and they laid hands and they prayed for Ricky. Rick, sorry, R for Richie. This week, Richie is walking. Come on. Come on, you got to feel the heart of a mother for that. And not only, listen, not only is Richie walking, the gap has closed. So he went from not walking to walking much straighter and far. So we just ask you to continue just praying for the family and for Richie. We just claim God's glory in this. So thankful. We're praying now for him to speak, my wife said. So the next thing is just start praying that, that Richie will speak. So we'll be covering them. The, their prayer is powerful. How old is Richie? He's 11 years old. So we always want to surround the families and be praying for one another. It's super, super important, and that's why we gather. Well, I'm excited this morning to kind of share a life verse of mine, and I have several life verses, but this one impacted me at a very critical time in my life. But we've been talking about one thing. And the first week when we were talking about one thing, we, we basically made it very clear that you can't focus on two things at once. Husbands. Just because you can repeat the last sentence doesn't mean you're focused. Right? Have you ever seen, like, you ever been talking to your spouse or talking to someone, and you're so ready to say the next thing, you're not listening to anything they're saying? Right? And you kind of do that pause interruption thing. Yeah, but hold on. Okay, and then you say, can I finish what I'm saying? The answer is always yes, but that doesn't mean you're going to listen to what they're saying. Because you're still ready, right? You have, a, you have a, a bullet in the chamber, and you're ready to let it go. So we use this term multitasking, and that is a computer term. It's the ability to focus or do two things at once. It's not a human term because it's not real. It is impossible to focus on two things at once and give 100% of your attention to both, right? We're not multitaskers. We're task switchers. 
right? So we, we go from a task and we quickly, and they did studies and proved that workers throughout the day, especially the new generation that have to jump on Facebook, they have to check their email and they have to, they start to let the release these endorphins of constantly switching tasks. It becomes an addiction that it literally tears down their ability to finish their work at the end of the day because those microseconds are taking away their focus. So what it equals is less productivity in any area of your life. So we've been talking about focus. And the focus is one thing. So where you're at, be all there. So at times you're doing something, you need to ask yourself, what's the one thing I should be doing? Right? What's the one thing I should be doing? Now, I love when people say this. So if you're looking at priorities in your life, Pastor Cal, how would you list them? You know, is it God, and then it's, you know, marriage, and then it's kids, and then it's work, and it's like, God's not really into listism. The schism's in the is, anyways. He's not into listism. It's more of a circular priority, right? That God is the center. So yesterday when I was doing a wedding for a, a dear friend of mine that I've known for years in hospice, and she owns a hospice, and she paused right there after I did the vows, and she looked at her now husband and said, Jesus will be the center of this marriage. See, she didn't say Jesus would be on top of the list. It's like the last time I did a kid's encounter, and I was trying to teach him on priorities, and I said, you know, so when you write a list for Christmas to Santa, what do you put on the top? And I'm trying to get, what do you want the most? And they go, dear Santa. And I realized I should not be ministering to children. <laughs> but God is more like, he wants to be the center of your life. Everything is a circular wheel. Let me give you an example. If you ate bad food and got food poisoned, and your stomach was making the noise that was similar to like a grizzly bear, priority one wouldn't be Jesus, spouse, kids. It would be bathroom. <laughs> Bathrooms first. See, it's a wheel. It rotates. Bathroom's first. Now, you can pray in the bathroom. Jesus can still be the center. But I'm going to tell you what. Bathroom's first. Right? So Jesus is the center and then priorities. So where you're at, be all there. What you're supposed to be doing, start giving your full attention to. If you're at dinner with your family, be at dinner with your family. Amen? If you're watching a movie, tell your children to let you watch. A Sorry, that's personal. But where you're at, so that's focus. And then last week, we talked about one thing I know. This I know, that God is for me. Not for us. For me. For Cal Whitmer. God is for me. God is for you. Even when you're against you, he's for you. And when you, re re when you understand that, it changes your identity. If you don't know it, you believe that God's against you or God's against other people. That's because you've never realized he's for you. The Bible says, he who's been forgiven of much loves much, but people that think they haven't did anything wrong don't feel they have anything to be forgiven from or to because they have their own righteousness. So today we're, we're talking about the one thing. So we talked about the one thing, focus, the one thing I know, and today is the one thing I do. Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. And this is what he says. After everything, he's been the Pharisee of Pharisees, right? He persecuted the Christian church. He got in the way. But he says, the one thing I do. And so when you start to think about this, before we go into the scripture, there's something that bonds all of us or connects us. It's pain. Whether you were born your socioeconomic status was very favorable and you had everything going for you, or whether you were born and you were in extreme poverty and you made it through, or you immigrated into this country and you're battling your way, whatever your situation is, everybody can relate to pain. It's amazing because we have some kind of mentality in this country that if you were born into a rich family, everything should be good. But it's amazing that it's people, celebrities and Hollywood people that actually attempt and succeed at suicide met more than normal people. So what we think the dream and the answer is, is really a part of the problem. Because it goes something like this. 
Yeah, but look what they have. And what that does is it puts our focus on other people, and we can never focus on ourselves. We'll never be happy because we know that comparison is the thief of joy. You're either trying to steal yours or steal somebody else's, right? You put people down to lift yourself up and feel righteous, or you tear yourself down and you say, I wish I was like other people. Either way, you lose your identity. But Paul says this, one thing I know, we have the ability to feel pain, whether it's physical, emotional, or spiritual. We all have that. But listen, you know what separates people? Pain will bring people together. What separates us is how we deal with it. Or if we deal with it at all. Because you hear people say it all the time, hurting people, but people won't deal with their hurt. Right? It's cool phrases with no legs never e equals any actions. But they've determined that emotional pain prevents you from healing from a situation, it's a sign that we aren't moving forward in a growth-oriented way. It will paralyze you in any form of spiritual, emotional, or physical growth. It's like the doctor who told the patient, I've told you, if I've told you once, I told you a hundred times, I don't treat amnesia patients. <laughs> Thank you. So Philippians chapter 3, 12 through 14, Paul says this, not that I've already obtained all this, or not that I've already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. So what he's saying is, it's not about perfection, it's about progression. He says, hey, man, I haven't arrived, but the one thing I do, the one thing I do, I love it, forgetting what is behind. The one thing I, can, one thing I do is forgetting what's behind. The past has the ability to rob your future if you empower it. No one gets to decide what family they're born into. But after that, the decisions are yours where you end up. You don't get to choose your starting line. We have a country that's trying to change everybody's starting line to be the first. I have news for you. It will never happen. But we get to determine our finish line. That's our choice. He says, the one thing I do is forgetting what's behind and straining towards what is ahead. I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which is God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. There is such a focus on the past, it's literally hindering people from moving to the future. The past is dead. It has no life unless you breathe it into your present or into your future. The past will keep you focused on what's behind you and you'll miss out the opportunities that are before you. I always say it like this. Don't drive down the freeway looking in the rearview mirror. But that's how people live their lives, and they don't understand why they're not getting anywhere. So Paul's basically saying this. Hey, I have a lot of faults, but living in the past isn't, isn't one of them. I, I haven't arrived I have a lot of faults, but one of my faults is not living in the past because there's no future in it. So I'm not saying you don't have faults. What I'm saying is you need to be one fault less today when you leave, and it needs to be living in the past because there's no future in it. Not for you, not for your family, not for your finances, not for your children, not for anyone. There is no future in the past. And I like this. You know what happens when you have people that love to dig up the past? You know what happens when you're always digging up the past? You don't get nothing but dirty. People are always digging up the past. I've been listening to conversations randomly, right, at like coffee shops and stuff, this week, and determining this. Are the people talking, talking about the past, the present, or the future? What do you think most people are talking about? And they don't understand 
why they can't see their future. If your conversations are always steered towards your past, you are literally missing the vision or the opportunity for your future. You can't change the past. You can tear down statues. You can rewrite history. You can do this. We just saw a, um, a show the other day on the, on the Holocaust. Oh, my God. We need to be aware of the past. But they're not tearing down all the prison camps. They want them there so you remember so you don't repeat. You can't change the past. But if you don't let it go, it not only can, but it will change you. You can't go where you can't see. And the eyes of faith is what will get you there. You notice people are never proud of their before picture until their after picture. If you really had confidence in what you were going to do, you'd post the, the before picture today. You wait to make sure you're going to pull it off. Right? You don't have the before picture and then like, you know, three months later you post the after picture and you look worse. You know, you're like, maybe I should just swap these. <laughs> and we all know that that can be difficult, but it's always funny to me. People post the before and after pictures when they weren't in shape and then they were in shape, but they don't post the one when they went from being in shape to out of shape. I just want a little reality. Point number one. Remove the rear view mirror of your life. Remove the rear view mirror of your life. Paul says, forgetting what is behind. If you're constantly talking about what's behind you, you're living in the past and the past is dead, which means you're not living. You're breathing life into something that has no ability to live. I always say it like this. Any faith and thought and worry that's associated with the past is worthless and becomes depression. Have you ever thought, man, if only I would have did this. Man, if only I would have taken that job. Man, that was stupid. You go over and over and over and over and over and over and over, but what are you doing? All you're doing is getting depressed and disappointed. Now, it's okay to recognize it, and it's okay to deal with it, but then you need to forget it and move on from it, right? There's things in your past, you know, if you're hiding from the cops, you might want to deal with it and not just forget it because it will remember you. But once you deal with it, it's time to move on from it. I can't tell you how many people that have a criminal record that are so afraid to put in a job application because they have to put felony on it. Stop identifying with the box you have to check. Start moving in faith and believing and apply for everything. Because there's people out there that will hire you, but if you don't apply, it's because the fear of the past has crippled you in the present and you have no future. We don't teach our kids to remember the mistakes they made last week, but yet we do it ourselves. My son has a way of quickly moving through conversations with dad. Don't you, Rowan? He says, I'm sorry. I said, hold on, I haven't finished. <laughs> He's so ready to forget the past. <laughs> if you keep looking back, you'll lose your future, or at least the minimum, you'll lose the sight of it. There's not an age that you should start looking back on your life. People do that when they're on their deathbed. They look back in gratitude and see their family. But until that time comes, everything should be ahead, whether you're 75 or 7. Because the hope of the future is what drives us forward. There's so many people during COVID that have been contemplating suicide and things like this. It's because they're so stuck in the news and the past that they can't see a future for themselves. As parents, we are called to give our children vision for their future because no one that has vision for the future wants to end their life in the present. 
It's when they lose that. We have to present a picture. And if we're not looking forward, then they have nothing to look forward to. Talk to your children about goals. Talk to them about what's coming next. I don't care. Talk to them about vacation. That's enough to stimulate them. <laughs> Yours, when they stay at home. No. But give them something to look forward to. Why do you think we have graduations at the end of the year? Why do we think there needs to be a time where something ends and you forget third grade and now you're looking forward to fourth? But as adults, we just get into this rut and somehow we lose sight of our future. The more you neglect the past, the more you'll notice the future. Hey, remember when? I don't want to talk about it. The more you talk about the past, think about it in your life, on your social media, the more you focus on your past, the more you're really neglecting your future. And you'll find that most people are disappointed and depressed because the past has nothing to offer you. Don't allow the pain of the past poison your present and your future. We all have pain from our past. And I'm sorry, I have this revelation a few weeks ago, I talked to my wife. I said, we're going to start doing real church because I've noticed that everybody loves a testimony of all the stuff that happened to us and how Jesus brought us through. But apparently, we forget about the stuff we did to other people that God brought them through. Yeah. Testimonies like, this happened to me. This it's all victim, but what about when you're the one that was on the other end? We don't talk about that. That would be too real for people. <gasps> you did stuff to people? I was bullied. Did you bully? Yeah. <laughs> but we're in church. We don't talk about that. I'm the victim. <laughs> Jesus opens his arms to the victims and the perpetrators. Just because the church does it doesn't mean he does it. It's not my notes. I knew a guy when I was in the military... He was dating a girl, and she passed away. She got cancer and passed away. She was early 20s, super rare. And he had a picture of her beside his bed, and I noticed the longer time had passed since she had passed, the better she got. The stories went from we had hard times to we had some hard times to she was amazing. Pretty soon, she just got to being perfect. And then when he entered another relationship, and compared his new relationship to his perfect past, he kept ruining his relationships. And the truth is, I'm not saying she wasn't good. I'm saying she wasn't perfect. So if you have fond memories of your past, and you keep comparing it to your dissatisfaction of your present, you're not doing a service to your life. We tend to remember situations, people, and circumstances in our past as way worse than they are, or were, or way better than they were. Rarely are they the same. It was either an amazing time, and it wasn't that amazing. Or it was terrible, and really it wasn't that terrible. Have no choice but to talk about the past because they have no vision for the future. So write out your goals. Write out your dreams. You know, create a collage, if that's you. Write it down. Look at it. Pray about it. Start to speak it. Start to look for what God has ahead. What are you dreaming about? The important things with family, maybe businesses, you know, what your impact on the earth is, those type of things, but also small things. What are you looking forward to? Write those things down so you keep yourself oriented in the right direction so you don't get confused. And stuck. Because we all have the potential to be stuck in periods of time the longer we look at the past. See, we've spent so much time as Christians and believers that we're feeding on the leftovers of yesterday's failures and accomplishments. But when God brought manna, he gave you enough to eat for today. He's going to give you enough vision for today, for the future. He doesn't want you feeding on the past. That's rotten food. It's not good for you. 
It won't make you feel better. It will make you angry. It'll make you bitter. It'll make you depressed. It'll make you sad. It'll make you worry. It'll make you sick. The future will inspire you, give you hope and joy. So I don't have long pause clap points. We'll have that on the screen next week. <laughs> C.S. Lewis said this, you're never too old to set another goal or to dream another dream. You're never too old to set another goal or to dream another dream. Start dreaming again. Everybody doesn't have to support your dream. You just have to be dreaming it. Thomas Jefferson said this, I like the dreams of the future better than the history of the past. Vision something seen in a dream. You can't pursue something you can't see. Listen to this. When we see those things, we need to start thanking God for them. So when you see things happening in your life, you need to have a, an attitude of gratitude. Because if you don't, if you don't teach your kids to be gracious, to have, have gratitude when people do things for them or give things to them, any of those things, what happens is if you don't thank God for the things, you can become jealous or bitter. When you stop being thankful for your life, you can become jealous or bitter. Then you see tragedy in someone else's life, and finally you realize that your life isn't that bad. You shouldn't have to see tragedy in other people's lives to thank God for yours. Amen? So write out what you want to do and what you want to accomplish and keep those things right in front of you as a family, right? What's the goals for your family? You know what I mean? Have a vision board. What are the goals for your life? Have you written down your goals? If you haven't written down your goals and told at least three people, they're not goals, they're wishes. You know, throw a coin in the fountain. It's not going to happen. But if you write them down and you tell three people, that's a direction you're moving, right? We must write down our goals and review them weekly. This will bring success to every area of your life. It will keep you from looking in the rearview mirror. And what will cripple you is fear. Listen, I, I know this is, this is rough when you're dealing with stuff. But if you're going to set goals in your life, start with the elephant in the room. Don't do these little side goals. If there's something that's attacking or hindering your life, some emotional pain or something going on, don't do these small goals around it. Shoot the elephant and move on. No, no, don't set these little sub goals. If you're an addict, goal number one, right? If you're in a toxic relationship, you need to bring in the light of Jesus, get some counseling, get some help. Goal number one, don't say, well, you know, I really want to start brushing my teeth three times. That's a great goal, but kill the elephant in the room. I want everyone in this church to have an elephant gun. Stop ignoring the things that are ruining your life and working on other things. That's a poor focus. Amen? Focus on the biggest thing, take it out, and you'll find the smaller things become easier. And all the wives said, make your goals clear. Don't worry, husbands, I pick on the wives because they say I talk like you, so it keeps us safe. And number three, don't quit. Make this a part of your life. Always be dreaming, coming up with new dreams, new visions. Let this be a part of your life where you're looking forward. I realized I was thinking about this the other day, and I thought, man, me and my wife, most of our conversations are about the future. Sometimes we get so far ahead, we get tired, and we haven't done anything yet. We have to bring it back. You ever done that? We're going to do this, and this month looks like, and you get to like month two, you're like, we need to stop. Because I'm exhausted. I need a nap. You've just been writing stuff down. But I realize we always talk about the future. The future of our children. The future of the church. The future of the business. The future of our marriage. We're always looking to the future. And per trust me, we're not perfect, but the one thing we do is forget the past and strain towards the future. That's a staple in our marriage. That's a staple when raising our children. 
That's a staple when figuring out what God wants to do and expand the church and the kingdom of God is forgetting the past because everybody has wounds. No more trauma bonding. It's time to faith bond. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. People that are stuck in the past will sit and talk about the past for hours. It's like Christians that are fasting talking about food. I always have a plan when I'm fasting. I have 10 restaurants that I want to try by the time I'm done. I'm very future focused. Listen to this. Thomas Carl says, Carlisle says this. Endurance is patience concentrated. One thing, patience. You know what that equals over a long period of time? Endurance. Patience in the King James Version means long suffering. Listen, some things are worth suffering for and your future is one of them. It's not going to come easy. Man, look at that person that won the lottery. It's not you. Focus, get goals, pray, and move in faith. Amen? Stop feeling sorry for yourself. You have to get rid of the victim mentality. Listen, it's not going to hurt other people. It's going to hold you back. If you see yourself as a victim, your life will always gravitate towards the way you see yourself. If you see yourself as a conqueror, your life will always gravitate towards the way you see people. Like, you're not a conqueror. As long as you see yourself as a conqueror, because I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. As long as you see it, you can live it regardless of what they think. And you'll be conquering. Amen? Teach the victims how to conquer. Henry Rollins, one of my favorite musicians. Story for another day. He said, scar tissue stronger than regular tissue. Realize the strength and move on. How many people do you need to tell about your hurt of the past before you're ready to move to the future? If you need to go see a professional, go see a professional. If you need to talk to your connect group leader and receive ministry, receive ministry. But how many people in your life do you need to keep telling about it before you're ready to move on? Well, I, I'm on 76, but I might meet somebody tomorrow. See, you don't want to meet someone and then tell them the pain of your past. You just identified that as a person. This is who I am. I'm a victim. You can mention the pain of your past, but you need to talk about the faith of your future. Look, here's where I was at. This is what God's done, and this is where I'm going. That produces hope and faith. My question is this, same question that Jesus asked this man, and we're closing. John 5, 6 through 9 says, when Jesus saw him lying there, he's talking about the man that was laying by the pool of Bethesda. He was laying there 38 years. Everybody keeps getting in the water before me. I can't get healed, and he's laying on his mat. It says, Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he'd already been in that condition a long time. He said to him, do you want to be made well? I am not trying to negate the seriousness and the pain of the past. At times it's crippling. It's paralyzing and it, at least it's so hurtful at times. Sometimes it's wrestling to forgive others and we'll talk a little bit about that next week. But man, a lot of it we don't talk about is really forgiving ourselves so that we can move on and do what God's called us to do. Because God has a plan for your life, even if you tried to mess it up. Or somebody else stepped in on it. But the question is, do you want to get better? Have you identified with your past so much that you won't even give yourself the possibility of change? Are you so comfortable where you're at that you have no goals for your future? Because if you think there's nothing left to change in your life, unfortunately, you're right. Because you won't change. The problem is Jesus will empower you, but it still takes effort. So he said, do you want to be made well? That's what Jesus asked him. Do you, do you want to be made well? Listen to his answer. I have no one to put me in the pool when the water's stirred, but I'm coming. Another steps up, rises. People keep getting in my way. I can't get hit. He didn't ask him that. He didn't say what happened. He says, do you 
want to get well. When someone asks you, do you want to get better? That's a yes or no answer, but we go, oh, you don't know what I've been through. You don't understand what's happened to me. You don't, back to the question, do you want to be made well? Because if you don't, you won't, unfortunately. You can't make somebody well that doesn't want it. You can't help somebody out of a situation if they identify and want to be there. Because even if you help them out, they'll go right back because it's how they see themselves. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. Rise up in your life today. You have to take with whatever you have right now. All he had was a mat. Maybe you have some more stuff. Maybe you have less stuff. Maybe you don't have anything. Take what you have, thank God for it, and start walking. God wants you to forget and release the things of the past that have been holding you back. Minivans were not made to carry 20,000 pound trailers. But some of us are trying to live that way. And no matter how much you put your foot on the gas, you can't seem to move forward. You need to cut it loose. You need to let it go. You need to undo the hitch and give yourself a chance to move forward. Come on, let's be standing in this place. Paul said, one thing I do. It's interesting because he said one thing, then he names two things. It's like a pastor and says, in closing, you know you got at least 15 more minutes. (laughs) The one thing I do, forgetting what's behind and straining towards what's ahead, that is one thing. There's no reason to forget what's behind if you're not going to move ahead. And you will not move ahead if you don't release what's behind. Old thought processes, old patterns of thinking, patterns of living. You can't change the past. But in Jesus' name, don't let it change you. Because he has a future for you and a hope. That's what he wants you to know today. Lord, I just thank you for your word this morning. Lord, I thank you that you want us to have dreams and visions, Lord, for the future that you've given us. Lord, right now we just want to thank you for the things you've done in our lives, the things we've recognized and the things that we haven't. Lord, we want to renew our minds today and be grateful for our lives, Lord. There's so many people that are suffering in the world. So many people that are being persecuted in this world. And Lord, we have nothing to complain about, but sometimes we still do. We ask you to forgive us for that today. Renew our minds. Lord, we thank you today for our friends, for our family, for the people you surrounded us. We thank you, Lord, for the good things that are happening in our life, Lord. And we ask you to give us vision for the future as we release the past today. Come on, there's been some things that have been burdening you you and hanging on you. The enemy keeps pointing at the past and keeps telling you you have no future or you're not, no one would even care if you didn't even, if you weren't even alive. Or there's nothing left worth living for. Listen, it's a lie. It's a lie. When the enemy lies, you know the opposite is truth. God has a plan for you. He's not done with you. You just need to see it. You need to embrace it. You need to be a conqueror and release the victim mentality. Today is the day that you let go and you strain ahead. It says straining towards the future. It doesn't say God will connect it. Straining means, well, it means straining. It has a look, right? It takes work. He wants you to strain today for the future because he has something amazing for you. I believe that with all of my heart. Lord, we thank you. And if you're in here this morning, you've never given your life to Jesus. That's why you're here. That's the first step. Because the cross has the ability to pull everything negative from the universe to it and release everything positive from it. Only at the cross. But listen. Unless you release 
the sin, unless you release everything that's negative, you can't receive the faith and the things that God has for you. The Bible says we've all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It also says he who has been forgiven much loves much. So we tend to have this mentality as long as we're better than other people that we're okay. But God created us to be perfect. And that's not some kind of mental challenge. It's a picture of grace. Because Paul says, not that I've achieved all this. I'm not perfect, but I'm progressing in, in grace. And when you have grace, there's no guilt. Jesus came and walked the earth. They took him and they beat him. He hung on a cross for six hours, paying for your my sin. Why? To give us a shot. That we would have an opportunity, that we would have a hope and a future. He died, they buried him, and three days later he rose from the dead. And the Bible says if you believe that in your heart and you confess it with your mouth, you'll be saved. What does that mean? It means you get to go to heaven, but it also means his grace will come upon you. That he will live with you today. That he will start to empower you. That when you strain, you will accomplish things that you never dreamed of because of his strength in your weakness. And if that's you and you've never given your life to Jesus, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day you release the past and move on towards your destiny and your future. So if that's you on a count of three, I want you simply just to raise your hand. Just be bold. Raise your hand in the presence of God, if that's you. On the count of three, one, two, three. Who needs Jesus this morning? Amen, 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 amen. Praise God. Awesome. It's a new beginning today. It's not a second chance. It's a new beginning for you and your family. It starts today. And I love it how you went first. The man of the house, you went first. And so that shall be a picture, a prophetic picture of your family as you release the past and move it into what God has for you in this new season. So excited. Anybody else, you need to give your life to Jesus. You guys are just excited for that side of the room? Anybody else, you need Jesus. We have time for you. You don't have to wait. Be bold. Then he's like, maybe next time. Do it this time. Anybody. Maybe you're in here and you used to live for God and you haven't been. Look, he's not angry. Who we got something over here? Come on. Praise God. Come on, church. You can do better than that. This is where it starts. The Bible says when one person surrenders to Jesus, there's a party going on in heaven, and then the church, something should be happening in here. Amen? The ladies. It's awesome. If you're in here and you need to rededicate this morning, you haven't been living, he's not angry. There's no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. He's been waiting your return. This is the day. If you need to rededicate this morning, just raise your hand. Let us pray for you. Anybody need to rededicate? All right. Awesome, young man. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Awesome. Love it. Anybody else? Anybody else? Okay, what we're going to do now is we're going to ask for you, if you raise your hand to give your life to the Lord or rededicate, we're going to ask you to come to the front. Don't worry. We're not going to have you talk to the microphone or anything. We just want to pray for you. But we ask, also, you don't have to come alone. Take someone with you. If you don't have anyone, pick someone. This will work. And have them stand behind you so we can pray. Come on, let's give them a hand as they come. Come on, you guys can move across the front. Won't be trapped. And if you didn't raise your hand, you can just sneak up here and act like you did. All right, what we're going to do now is we're just going to pray. So just repeat after me, church. They'll repeat after me as well. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Forgive me for my sins. Come into my heart. 
be my Lord, be my Savior. And Lord, empower me to live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. (laughs) Second Corinthians 5.17 says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Listen, it's already started. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have been made new. So just by walking up here and receiving Jesus, old things have passed away. He's already forgotten about your sin, and you can join him in that. You couldn't even ask him now to forgive you for your sin because he's already forgotten it when you repented. If you came to him right now, you're perfect in his presence. He sees you this morning as if you've never sinned, and now he's empowered you to walk out this life he has for you and your families. I see what God's doing in this place. I don't see just people, but I see generations generations being impacted this morning. I see what God's doing and it's just the start. So excited for all of you. Um, We have Miss Tammy right over here. She's just going to pray with you guys and get some information so we can stay in contact with you. Take about just five minutes. So we want to keep you guys connected with us if you need anything or prayer requests. Come on, let's give them a hand as they go.